and go. Good afternoon and welcome to our daily Plymouth COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth Town Moderator, and we're here each day this week, Monday through Friday at noon for this update, which is number 44, coming to you live on May 13th, 2020. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast channels 13 and 15 and Verizon channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on PAC-TV's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. Today, for your questions during our forum, please email us to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And these forums can also be replayed at PACTV.org slash Plymouth. Today, we're joined by Kenneth Tavares, the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen, and also Representative Matthew Miratori. And we welcome Dr. Christopher Ogilvy. He is the endovascular and operative neurovascular surgery neurosurgeon at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. We also welcome Dr. Mark Wilson. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan School of Public Health Department of Epidemiology. Each Wednesday, we also welcome Michael Jackman. He is on the staff with Congressman Bill Keating's office. Heather Cosby is a local CPA. Amy Naples is the Executive Director for the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. These cable casts are date stamped each day in the top right hand corner so that you'll know that this is coming to you live on May 13th. We are bringing you officials and experts in fields that are responding to the coronavirus to help viewers understand how we can continue to respond appropriately. And at this time, we're going to begin with the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen, Kenneth Tavares. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back on such a beautiful day today. And certainly, if you have the opportunity, it's great to just step outside and take in that sunshine. Last night, the uh, Board of Selectmen held a lengthy meeting uh, on uh, this channel, and we discussed town meeting and annual town meeting articles. A great deal of discussion with, and detail was given in regards to some articles that could possibly be changed. Also, we were able to hear from our town manager and Lynn Barrett in regards to uh, various uh, things that could be done to the budget for fiscal year 20 and 21. The board is in the information gathering stage right now. There aren't any hard decisions that have been made, but we're, we are gathering the information so when the time comes, we will be prepared. Also, uh, next week, we hadn't planned on having a meeting, but we are going to meet next Wednesday at 5 o'clock to discuss the recreational areas and the uh, protocols that will be in place uh, for use by the public of, of these areas. So I advise everyone, to, if they can, to tune in next Wednesday to hear what the changes uh, will be and how we can uh, utilize these areas, uh, hopefully much more than we've been able to to date. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Kenneth Tavares. He is the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Each day we begin our panel with a health segment, and today we're delighted to welcome for the first time Dr. Christopher Ogilvie. He is with Beth Israel Deaconess, the Brain Aneurysm Institute, and uh, I can disclose, uh, he can't, but I can let you know that uh, he actually is my neurosurgeon, and he successfully treated me uh, several years ago for a brain aneurysm. So, uh, Chris, thank you for all of your uh, help and support for me and my family and uh, other people that know me. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, welcome uh, to this update. And what can you tell us regarding surgery uh, during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, Steve, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. And I'm sure many of you have been following uh, the, the national news where they interview lots of physicians from all over the country. And many things come out in those interviews. Uh, so specifically for surgery, what's been going on, I do work with stroke and Steve, as you know, with hemorrhage from brain aneurysms, stroke is a very common problem. Uh, I'll just start by saying there's a couple of issues that have been going on in the community, um, communities like yours, which is people aren't going to the hospital. People are having minor symptoms, uh, they're staying home, 
and we're seeing a drop in the care of even urgent and emergent problems. And we think it's because people are not presenting to the hospital, to their physician, reporting what's going on. They're afraid to come in. The problem with that is things can progress and, and disability or death can occur. So people might be not surviving events that they normally would survive. So when they, when they do make it to the hospital uh, and when they do come to the hospital with their complaints, um, then we're left to, to treat them. And I've actually been uh, working pretty much every day because I do do emergency work. Uh, but that's all that's been going on. As many of you know, a few weeks ago, all the hospitals uh, in the country really were shut down for elective surgery. This set into motion a number of, of things. One is um, the hospitals ground to a halt for a while. We were just doing elective work. Uh, we were just doing emergency surgery because the elective stuff was blocked. And it still is actually. Um, we now are doing an emergent work uh, only. And what that set off in the hospitals is in the clinic areas, uh, patients weren't being seen as outpatients, routine blood pressure checks weren't being done. So within the order of three to six weeks, many things happened of which you hopefully are seeing right now. Uh, you can now do televisits. We can do video visits like we're doing right now with patients to try to keep in touch. Um, uh, in fact, tomorrow I have a patient day. I'm seeing 18 patients and 17 of those are by computer or on the phone. One is coming in in person. And of course, we'll use distancing and all the rules for that. Um, but this all happened in very short order in medicine. So you all have seen huge changes. For surgery, what's going to happen, it's predicted now, it was, it was set for the 18th and now the 23rd, where elective surgeries will be started again. And it's not a switch you can just throw. Many of the people who work doing surgery, helping with surgery, were redeployed within the healthcare system. Uh, nurses were redeployed to rehab hospitals to take care of COVID patients, which is appropriate. The ICUs, which were jammed with COVID patients, are finally starting to open up uh, and open up beds, allowing us uh, to do work uh, of more elective and non-urgent nature. Again, it's, it's, uh, perception is a huge thing. And many of the patients don't want to come into a large city, whether it be New York City or Boston, to have an elective procedure done for fear of COVID contamination. I can assure you, at least at our institution, there's a ton of mechanisms such that as we resume surgery, it's a gradual thing. And we're trying to do the more urgent patients or patients that have been waiting uh, for longer intervals, even for so-called elective work, although nothing is, is that elective that it could wait years and years, um, and we're trying to stratify those patients. And when they are treated, keep them exceedingly safe. They, they are entering the hospital through a non-COVID situation. They're tested before surgery um, uh, and throughout their hospitalization and then as they're discharged. So it's a completely different process. And it's kind of rewriting how we're doing things within the hospital. It makes it more cumbersome. It makes it more time consuming, but it makes it safe, which is, which is really the goal. But it has been, uh, as for all of you, complete disruption and change of how we do things. We're trying to rapidly adapt um, uh, taking care of patients. And for urgent and emergent work, it's extremely cumbersome. We uh, don't know patient status, their COVID status coming in the hospital. So we many times assume that they could be positive. And there's lots of protocols in place uh, to manage those patients, their airways, contamination, healthcare workers, and that's very time consuming um, uh, so that a procedure that might normally take three hours might take six hours with all those checks and balances in place. But that's okay. We, we don't mind the time as long as, as, long as it's kept safe. And, and specifically for what I do, stroke and hemorrhage, these are emergent procedures sometimes where minutes count. Patients are, are, are transported up from Plymouth Hospital uh, by ambulance with the siren screaming where every minute counts. So we like to get the patients in the hospital. And by the time they hit the door to the time they're treated is sometimes 15, 20, 30 minutes. And in those situations, we have to accelerate some of these safety, safety maneuvers, uh, but they still can slow the process. But we're really working hard to keep all of it moving um, uh, while trying to take care of patients. Thank you, and that is Dr. Christopher Ogilvy. He is from the Brain Aneurysm Institute, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. He is also a professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. 
He'll stay with us. He'll be joining on the questions. You can email us at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And now we're going to go to Dr. Mark Wilson. Dr. Wilson is an epidemiologist from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Mark, welcome back today. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, it's great to be with everyone. Um, I thought, as, as I've done before, I would try to address a few questions that have arisen over the week. And um, I'll start with one that is, why has the decline in the number of hospitalizations and deaths been so slow? We all know that in Massachusetts, the new cases are continuing to, to decline, but we also know that it's not even among counties, cities, and towns. And this decline really reflects our collective efforts at phys physical distancing, wearing masks, uh, minimizing travel, the non-essential closures, and so forth. So there's clear evidence that there's impact, and it really gives justification to um, this disruption that we're all experiencing. But there's a time lag from exposure and infection to symptoms and testing, and then to severe cases that appear in hospitals. So that hospitalization time lag uh, behind new cases um, is, is a lag that um, has to be expected, and it's one that even precedes the, the longer lag of uh, deaths. Deaths that could occur two to week, two to say uh, five weeks even after uh, infection. So it's not surprising, but we're also beginning to see uh, declines in both hospitalization and death rates in Massachusetts. One proviso here is be careful of the day-to-day -day variation. Uh, this is one reason why epidemiologists will use say a three-day average because there can be fluctuations that have nothing to do with uh, overall trends, but rather just uh, various reporting and so forth. Um, a related issue that I'll just quickly mention has to do with how you measure the hospitalization rate or hospitalization percent. It's defined by the number of hospitalizations, but divided by the total number of cases or total number of infections. Remember that infections are not the same as disease. We can have people who are infected asymptomatically without any symptoms, without any disease. Um, and the more we test in the general population, the more we're going to find infections. And that then will reduce actually the proportion or percentage of hospitalizations for every case. So these are numbers that, that vary depending on how we define and, and test. Uh, as there are more cases that are recognized, the hospitalization and death rate will actually be changing. Another question that was asked is sort of related to this. Why has there been a change in the model forecast of the number of future COVID cases, both nationally and globally? Can we really trust these model forecast estimates? Remember that the models are based on a combination of historical and contemporary data and assumptions about the dynamics of transmission, what contributes to risk of transmission. These forecasts are updated as we learn more about the epidemiology of COVID disease and the biology of this new virus. New to us, of course, it's been around for a very long time, but it's new to us. So there's historical and contemporary case data that's changing. There are delays in the reporting, and so updates to the current situation. Laboratory testing sometimes will be late in arriving, and reporting takes some time. Um, and so we, we have uncertainty in these forecasts. Um, the new studies that are now being done will help us to adjust the models to understand better the risk of transmission of the virus, uh, the amount of asymptomatic transmission, and so forth. So all of these are part and parcel of the modeling and forecasting process. Uh, they contribute to components of, of the uh, forecast, forecasted uh, numbers. I know this is frustrating for all of us, really, that the results are changing, uh, but they represent the best possible analyses that we can envision. And this updating is really important because it helps us to develop and, and evolve our policies for prevention and the eventual lifting of constraints. So we should be thankful for these analysis, analyses, even though they're, they're a bit frustrating when they're changing, because they're, they're really much better than simple gut feelings or wishes. 
Next question is, what is the evidence that there will be a decreased transmission during the summer? Which is, of course, a period which it, in which uh, we have hotter and more humid uh, weather. I think the simple answer is the evidence is very weak. It's really circumstantial, it's inferential, and it's aspirational. Um, there's experimental evidence to suggest that SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that's causing COVID-19, will survive for less long, will, will not survive as long in, in higher temperature settings or in higher humidity. But we spend more time indoors in the summer. And of course, we are oftentimes in air conditioned settings and in confined spaces. So not clear what impact, if any, that might have. There's epidemiologic evidence as well. Um, by analogy, many other respiratory infections are less frequently seen in the summer months. Uh, influenza, for example, uh, the common cold, which is also a coronavirus, but almost everyone has partial immunity to these, uh, both the flu and the cold viruses, and yet they're still transmitted just less frequently. And in addition to that, let's keep in mind that um, the current outbreak involves many countries that are warm and humid at this very moment, uh, tropical countries or some even in the southern hemisphere where it's their summer. So we really can't count on there being a, a, a decrease in transmission in the summer. We can hope for it, and, and uh, there may be good reason to believe that some decline will occur due to environmental conditions. But really, that's not an excuse to uh, let up on our uh, practicing of safe distances, covering our mouths and nose, washing our hands, and so forth. Finally, a question. Uh, after I am infected with the coronavirus and recover, Will I be protected against another infection? And if so, for how long? Unfortunately, we really don't know. Um, but in general, viruses and more broadly, microbial agents that cause disease produce protective antibodies to future reinfection or re-exposure. Um, again, the common cold, we see antibodies that protect us against uh, reinfection with the same uh, strain of that virus, um, but we lose protection after time. In the case of SARS-1 infection that occurred in people who were part of that outbreak um, a while back, detectable antibodies were found in those people for months to years after they were exposed. So there's some promise of long-lasting infection, uh, long, sorry, long-lasting uh, protection to infection with the current COVID uh, situation. But we, we really don't know. Not all antibodies are protected, uh, protective sorry, against new exposure. And so um, we need to take the evidence that antibodies in a Petri dish uh, that protect against growth of the virus will actually confer protective immunity in the, in the human being and in the context that uh, we will be experiencing after being infected. So, we really need to uh, follow up epidemiologically. We really need more antibody testing and prospective uh, monitoring of people who have been exposed, who show antibodies to see how long they last and whether or not they're uh, at risk of new exposure. Let me stop here, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions the viewers might have later on. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson. He is the active professor emeritus, University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Each Wednesday, we welcome our federal partner from Congressman Bill Keating's office, uh, Michael Jackman. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I was on mute there. I apologize. Um, it's great to hear uh, from Dr. Wilson again. It's so important to have the scientific information. And also, thank you to Dr. Ogilvy and all the frontline health care workers for all you're doing. And and keeping us safe and healthy during these times. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about basically updates on the programs we've been talking about uh, for the last two weeks. Um, the stimulus, economic impact payments, we're getting still getting a lot of calls about that. And um, we are uh, trying to get information out to people about when they should expect their check. The best thing for folks to do is to go to the irs.gov website. There are two portals there. 
the Get My Payment portal, uh, where they can, using your adjusted gross income from your most recent tax return, you can um, identify yourself and also by your Social Security number, obviously, and uh, get information about when your check should be coming. The other portal being the non-filers enter info portal for a lot of Social Security and uh, veterans benefit beneficiaries don't necessarily have to file tax returns based on their level of income. But um, if they have direct deposit information on hand with the Treasury, if they get their VA or they get their Social Security benefits by direct deposit, they will be included in the, um, the current or the earlier stages of the economic impact payments. Um, a lot of folks are running into issues. Unfortunately, at this time, our office does not have any ability to check on an individual uh, payment. Um, we are referring people to the portal and to the website to try to get information. But um, payments are coming out. Information is coming out from the IRS on a weekly basis. So we're doing our best to try to get that information out to people so they know what to expect and when to expect their um, economic impact payment. If you do not have direct deposit information on, on file with the Treasury, with Social Security or the IRS or the VA, then uh, you are going to get a paper check. The IRS is sending out 5 million checks per week. They started with the folks with the lowest adjusted gross income and are working their way up. Um, they anticipate that it'll be about 100 to 120 million checks they'll have to print and uh, send out. So at $5 million a week, that's a few months' worth of um, payments that need to go out. Uh, also, staying with the IRS, another common question we're getting is about the uh, people who have not got their tax refunds yet for 2019. Of course, the IRS did extend the deadline for filing your taxes until July 15th. 20, sorry, 2020, July 15, 2020, for your 2019 tax return. If you have not filed yet, I would strongly recommend that you electronically file either through the IRS free file system, through a tax preparer, uh, because if you file a paper return, you're going to have to wait. And that's just reality because the IRS just does not currently have the ability to process individual paper tax returns because so many of their taxpayer assistance centers, assistance centers are closed due to the uh, pandemic. Um, so strongly urge you to file e-file. Um, if you have questions about that or questions about where your refund is, again, the IRS does have a portal, Get My Refund, but you can call as well. And this number is for you know, return and refund information only. Do not call this number for questions about the economic impact payments for refunds and returns call 1-800-829-1954. Uh, again, every week we talk about the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, Heather probably has better information than I do, but I did want to address one issue that we've talked about before. Some <clears throat> companies that have received uh, PPP loans were concerned because their employees um, are, uh, might be doing better with the unemployment program because the CARES Act did, uh, did add $600 a week to uh, individual unemployment benefits. And so one of the, some of the guidance we're, we're getting from uh, the SBA indicates that if a borrower does have a PPP loan and they're looking to have it forgiven because they're tr tried to spend 75% of it on payroll, which is one of the requirements for forgiveness, will the forgiveness amount be reduced if the borrower has laid off an employee, offered to rehire the same employee, but the employee declined the offer? And SBA is saying, no, the forgiveness amount will not be reduced. They might have to, you know, prove that they did offer the, uh, the employee of their job back. Um, it is important to note also that employees who reject offers of reemployment might forfeit their well, forfeit their eligibility for continued unemployment compensation. And that's important for folks to realize if they're offered a job and um, they don't take it because they're doing better on unemployment than they would be getting paid through the pay payroll protection program, then they might uh, not be eligible for that unemployment compensation. 
And that's important to note. Um, last thing, I well, a couple things I want to mention, um, sort of on the uh, topic of ongoing relief programs. We're getting a lot of calls in our office about hazard pay for healthcare workers, frontline workers, maintenance, um, security workers, people who have to be working, uh, grocery workers, essential workers. There is a bill that was released yesterday by the House. It will be considered on Friday. So Congressman Keating will be heading down to D.C., socially distancing and um, keeping himself safe as he travels, no doubt, to vote on this bill, the HEROES Act. It's, it's the largest stimulus bill ever considered by the U.S. Uh, government, by the Congress. It includes hazard pay for essential workers, includes funding for testing, rent and mortgage assistance, uh, additional unemployment, additional PPP assistance, uh, relief for the post office, and funding for election safety. And it would have another, it would include another $1,200 uh, economic impact payment, and, and it would increase the num amount for dependents from 500 to 1200 Now, this is proposed by the House, and any bill that's proposed by the House, whether if it passes the House, it has to be passed by the Senate as well before it goes to the president's desk. So it's not a done deal, I guess is the way to put it. Um, but we will, shall see what happens. Uh, I'm sure everyone will be watching the news to see if this passes, and I'll ho hopefully have another update for you next week on that. Last thing I want to mention uh, before we move on is, I think I mentioned this last week, but every spring our office hosts a service academy information night for high school students and their families who are interested in West Point the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Merchant Marine Academy, the Coast Guard Academy. And we are hosting that on Zoom uh, on Thursday, May 21st uh, at 6 o'clock. If you're interested, if you're a student or a family member and you're interested, please contact me in the Plymouth office, 508-746-9000. And we, are, we, we usually host that forum at Mass Maritime. And we will have representatives from Mass Maritime Academy on as well to answer questions. We're really looking forward to that. We've got a great response so far. I have about 30, 35 students who've signed up. But uh, being, being that it's Zoom, I think we uh, have capacity for even more th thanks to the account I have. So that's all I have for now, Steve. Thank you again for doing this. And thank you to Julie and the PAC-TV team for um, offering an opportunity to share this information. Thank you, Michael Jackman. He is with the Office of Congressman Bill Keating. He'll be here for your questions. Send them to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. We now welcome Heather Cosby. She is a Plymouth CPA. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Steve. Um, good to be back again. I am, uh, there's not a lot of new updates, but I do want to clarify a few things. Uh, the first thing is, is I heard, I, I saw this yesterday. It's the first time I've heard or seen it, so I wanted to mention it. Massachusetts Department of Unemployment is texting uh, applicants. So I had somebody who's been waiting for probably over a month to get a, re a callback regarding their application. It was a little bit tricky. And uh, they actually received a text, and it's a valid text. It's not a scam. And so uh, so they, they they texted back and forth in order to get a few things cleared up, and they're, they're working on it. So if you haven't heard from unemployment and you have an outstanding claim that you're waiting for them to contact you on, Pay attention to your texts and uh, and and just don't. I, I'm surprised I never heard that they were doing that before. So that was news to me. Um, the second thing I just wanted to update was as of today at noon, if you did not have your um, banking information uploaded with the IRS, that you cannot you cannot give it to them anymore regarding the, the stimulus payment, the twelve hundred dollars. That shut off at noon today. So if if you uh, didn't get it updated and you haven't received the payment, then you will be getting a check. Uh, if for some reason you, your, your filing situation doesn't allow you to even get the check, then you will still have the opportunity on your 20 uh, tax return that's filed next April to claim that as a credit. So um, I'm not excited to hear that we're going to have to go through another round of this when we haven't finished one round of it, but hopefully things will continue to move along. Um, and uh, the next thing I wanted to re-highlight was there was a period of time where the uh, the due dates weren't quite perfect as far as what was extended. So it used to be that the 2019 taxes and um, were extended and the first quarter estimates were extended, but not second quarter estimates. 
But that has all now been fixed. I don't remember which bill did it, but as of today, all of the due dates from between April 15th and July 15th are moved to July 15th. That is your 2019 tax return payment, your first quarter 20 estimated tax payment, your second quarter estimated tax payment. All three of those, if you have amounts due, will be due on July 15th. That is for federal and Massachusetts purposes. Most states have adopted the same rule, but I can't speak for all states. Uh, but Massachusetts definitely did. So there could be a lot of check writing that needs to happen on July 15th for a lot of taxpayers. And I just wanted to highlight that because it's, it's coming around the corner, really. Um, the, the, another item that I talked about last week that I was really excited about is uh, that I think is important for every business that has received your PPP funding is this concept of whether or not the deductions you use are going to be allowed to be deducted or not. And this was a, um, I'll call it a correction needed in the bill that uh, that correction has been proposed in the Senate. It's bill number 3612. That bill is right now in the, uh, in the Committee on Finance. It is not a part of the bill as far as I understand that Mr. Jaffin was just talking about. This bill has bipartisan support and the Treasury Secretary spoke on it last week and said he'd be in support of the corrections if it had bipartisan support. So again, I cannot tell you how important this bill is for every business that receives PPP funds. If this bill does not go through, you are going to have a tax liability related to this tra these transactions that you are not expecting and was not made clear to you. So uh, continue to follow. It's, it's, it's Senate Bill 3612. We want to make sure that that gets through and, or gets accounted for in another bill that's been proposed. Um, so no movement on that. The other item I talked about that unfortunately there's still no movement on is, is the whole debt forgiveness process of these PPP funds. SBA has indicated they'd be providing guidance on their website in mid-May. As of this morning, that guidance has not been provided. Uh, the only update that SBA has on their website is in their frequently asked questions, and that has to do with the certification of whether or not your business you know, needed, was impacted and needed, needed these funds. Uh, that issue, I'm going to highlight only for anybody who received a, more than a $2 million loan. If you received a PP loan, PPP loan of more than $2 million, when it comes to the debt forgiveness, you are going to be scrutinized heavily. Just know that, start looking into it, make sure you have all your ducks in a row. Um, and I think, I mean, that's all that we have right now. I'm happy to, to be back and see everybody and, and take any questions. Thanks. Heather Crosby, a CPA in Plymouth. We're now going to Amy Naples. She's the Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Amy. You're back from your concert. I sure am. Hi, Steve. Great to see you. So, of course, as Steve just mentioned, we had our first fundraiser um, for the Plymouth One Fund, Couchella, which was a huge success. So thank you, Plymouth, for your support and tuning in. Couchella was live on PAC TV's community channels, and we had 19,000 people watching on YouTube and Facebook Live. So that is amazing. It was such a great evening bringing the community together with a night of awesome local musicians and a wonderful spotlight on our small businesses. Again, we can't thank PAC TV enough for producing the show and working with us on every possible detail. It, it would not have been possible without them and their expertise. So I just want to say how lucky we are to have PAC TV and their dedicated staff that work so hard for our entire community because something like Saturday night would not have been possible. So thank you again. Um, we raised close to $70,000 and we are so eager to get the money out to our small businesses. And we are hopeful the application will be on the Chamber's website, PlymouthChamber.com next week. We are just finalizing all of that now. And on another note, um, our Plymouth Recovery Task Force is seeking your opinion and guidance as we look to bring together a business reopening plan for the town of Plymouth. We hope through collective action, we can ease the concerns and make positive impacts together on our local economy. So we have created two surveys, one for our businesses and one for our citizens. And this feedback will be so helpful in addressing the concerns from both the businesses and the citizens. Um, surveys will be on the Plymouth Chamber website as well as the Town of Plymouth website and also distributed through all of our social media platforms because it's so important for us to gain that feedback. 
Um, the Plymouth Recovery Task Force was created to address economic issues that are specific to citizens, workers, and businesses in Plymouth, of course, impacted by COVID-19. Members of the task force represent the Plymouth Area Chamber, Town of Plymouth, the Town of Plymouth Board of Health, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation, C Plymouth, and then we have various industry representatives in entertainment and event, restaurants, retailers, higher education, transportation, hospitality, and nonprofit. Those liaisons and in the industries are so important for helping us identify any barriers so that we can work on the rapid recovery of our local economy and work around those barriers. It's so important for us to identify those. Um, in addition, we will identify short-term goals, particularly right now um, around the recovery phase and the reopening, as well as we'll have long-term goals of expansion impacting both existing businesses and potential new businesses. And I can tell you that the task force, all members are so committed to serving our citizens and our business community. So that is our update for today, Steve. Thank you, Amy Naples, Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. She'll be with us for our questions. Please send them PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. We're now going to Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. Welcome, Matt. Hey, good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a little uh, quick update on a follow-up on what Dr. Ogilvie was talking about with regards to the uh, uh, to the numbers, particularly the hospitalizations, and uh, hopefully getting folks to uh, contact the PCPs if they do have any medical issues. They shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't have to wait. Um, they should be going to the hospital if they need to. Um, so the hospitalizations, we'll start with that. Uh, we are still at four percent, which is which is a good number. There are 3,127 uh, folks with uh, confirmed virus in hospital in our hospitals in the Commonwealth. 818 of them are in the ICU. Uh, those numbers are a little bit higher, uh, up by 25 beds uh, in the hospitals from the day before, uh, but still a far cry from April 21st when there were 3,965 people in the hospital uh, from this virus. So, uh, so that uh, that looks uh, that looks good. Uh, with regard to how um, the testing looks, uh, we had another 6,768 folks tested um, from the day before. So we're over the 400,000 mark at 401,496 folks have been tested or at 5.7%, uh, uh, with an increase uh, from the day before of 870 more cases of positive uh, COVID-19, or 13% uh, of the, those tested from the day before. Uh, and, and but however, the overall confirmed cases are now under 20 percent, a little under 20 percent right now, whereas we've been running 21, 20 to 21 percent of those uh, tested have been um, have been positive. Uh, back in uh, early April, late March, it was running 30 percent. So we're seeing the numbers of those going down. Um, unfortunately, the um, the death toll is still continuing and another 33 from the day before uh, or over 5,000, 5,141 deaths. 98.5% uh, of them, again, have had, had underlying conditions. Um, you know, some interesting stats on this, too, that the, the, the folks, the, the, the age group, um, obviously the highest age group of folks that have passed away from this are, there's are, been 3,215 um, deaths over the age of 80, 1,171 uh, between the ages of 70 and 79, and 504 between the ages of 60 and 69. So 95% of those that have passed away have been over the age of, of 60. Um, with regard to um, the long-term care facilities, um, to date, we've had um, we've been able to um, test over 39,655 folks uh, within our long-term care facilities. Again, assisted living, uh, uh, skilled nursing facilities, and rest homes, uh, with total positive cases of 16,788. Uh, with one in uh, at least one case in 336 facilities out of the 680 there there are in the Commonwealth, and uh, with regard to the number of homes that have been tested, we've almost there of testing all of them. We're at 649 of these facilities have been tested, and again, 60% of the deaths, uh, 3,095, have come from long-term care facilities. Uh, with regard to Plymouth County, uh, Plymouth County has uh, positive cases of uh, 6,507. That's up 50 from the day before, and the total deaths uh, climbed by one more in Plymouth County to uh, 409 um, from the day before. 
And in Plymouth, uh, we are at 359 cases of confirmed COVID-19 with uh, 23 uh, deaths at this point. Um, with regard to the um, with regard to the counties, I know this question came up yesterday, Steve. So I, I just want to put the numbers in perspective a little bit. Um, with regard to the the numbers of confirmed cases in um, in the counties, in in um, with regard to the, the amount of deaths, Middlesex County is the highest at uh, 1,244. Suffolk County, which includes Boston, is 732. Essex is 678. Norfolk has 663 confirmed deaths. Hamden County has 464. Worcester County, Worcester County has 459. And Plymouth is at 409. So at least it puts it in perspective where Plymouth County sits with the, uh, with the amount of, of deaths at, at this point. Uh, the open bed situation at um, uh, in the southeast region uh, for hospitals is still running about the same. It's 44% open bed, so it goes to what Dr. Ogilvy was talking about um, that uh, you know folks need to you know go to the hospital. Don't wait for any issues that are happening to maybe cause more problems in your health. Uh, but uh, there is bed capacity uh, at these hospitals. Again, 44% of the beds are open um, right now. Uh, um, um, there's, there's openings in ICUs as well as regular beds as well uh, on the southeast region and uh, in the Commonwealth it's 54 percent so okay. do have uh, bed capacity. Uh, at BID Plymouth there are 70 suspected and confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, with eight of those folks being in the ICU. I also wanted to uh, just put in perspective the age groups which I thought was kind of interesting for those that have been confirmed with the COVID-19. Um, and interestingly enough, the age group uh, with the highest amount of cases is the age group between 50 and 59, 12,848. The second group is, is 12,070, uh, with a good majority of those in long-term care facilities. The, th the third group, which I thought was interesting, was uh, at 11,760 cases is the age group between 30 and 39. The fourth group was uh, between ages of 40 and 49, 11,400. Uh, the fifth group was ages 60 to 69 at 10,536. Uh, the next group was between the ages of 20, 20, and 29, 10,072. And the second to last group was the age between 70 and 79, uh, which was 7,450 confirmed cases. And then anyone under 19 was uh, less than 3,000, 2,947. I just thought those those numbers were, uh, were interesting when uh, when looking at those. Um, and, and when Dr. Ogilvy was talking about the modeling that was created, we had talked about it on this show, Steve, several weeks ago, that the models in Massachusetts showed that it would be somewhere between 47,000 and 205,000 confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19. And again, we're at almost uh, 80,000 today. Uh, so we're in there with that range group, but the, the death toll was somewhere between 705 and 2,500. And of course, we've more than doubled the 2,500 uh, and climbing. So I just thought that was uh, interesting uh, to, to bring up. With regard to what's happening at the State House, we are going to be in session at the House uh, at 115 today. Uh, we're going to be taking up a bill filed by Governor Baker for a $1 billion supplemental uh, budget uh, to help with uh, COVID related expenses within the Commonwealth. Uh, most of that, or if not all of it, is expected to be reimbursed by the feds. So it's going to be a borrowing bill. Um, also, um, with regard to the, the opening uh, of the economy, uh, on Monday, um, the governor will, will outline the plans that, have been, that are being put forth by the advisory um, group that he put together. Um, but the openings to, um, uh, on Monday will be those that are most likely that are currently already open and operating. Uh, but there'll be some some um, under there'll be under stricter state guidelines uh, and industry specific guidelines as well. So that will be the first wave on Monday will be announced. The second wave, uh, most likely the week after, will be those who don't have a lot of face to face interaction with customers. And then the third and fourth phase will be those uh, that have uh, the most uh, contact with customers. Um, but one of the one of the new norms that uh, that we should probably mention as well. We've talked about. Um, if you're going to be interacting with the public, wearing masks, having gloves, getting a lot of cleaning supplies, there's, there's a bunch of protocols we talked about earlier in the week. But one of the items that folks may need to think about getting as well, which may be part of the protocols, is plexiglass. So whether you have a, a business, whether it's a restaurant, you have a counter, 
what people pay or whatever it may be, you may start thinking about putting up plexiglass. I was at the Tracy Chevy, uh, Chevy dealership yesterday and they're, they're putting um, plexiglass uh, at the desks of where the, where the, uh, the car dealers uh, actually sit. Um, and then on the other side of the desk, you know, are the customers where they're sitting. So, uh, so I think you're going to be seeing uh, more and more of that as well. And uh, so that, that is the, uh, um, the update for uh, today, Steve. Thank you. And that is Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. He'll be here to answer your questions. We're going to go right to the questions now. Uh, the first question is to Dr. Christopher Ogilvy. Uh, Dr. Ogilvy, a viewer asks, of the thousands of people who have had this virus and recovered and have not been hospitalized, what protocol is used for their treatment and what's the average length of time it takes to get over COVID-19? Well, as you uh, probably know, once you are identified as having it uh, or suspected of having it, you're supposed to quarantine for at least 14 days. And it's felt that uh, that, that interval uh, will be sufficient so that the, that the virus will pass in the given individual. It's not entirely clear what the protocol is going to be once someone has tested positive and recovers and then continues to test positive. This is coming up now. Um, you know, we have individuals who come in and out of the hospitals, workers, uh, sales representatives, uh, vendors, um, other individuals who come in and out of the hospital. If they have had COVID and tested positive, it's not clear what to do with them if their test doesn't turn negative. Um, we're dealing with that right now. And also in patients. Uh, I took care of a woman yesterday who was positive two months ago, at which point we diagnosed a brain problem that she had. We took care of it yesterday. And um, uh, it, it, we handled her as a COVID positive patient because we couldn't get a COVID negative reading, even though she's probably not infectious per se, but she still is positive. So there's, there's, there's gonna be gradations to this and, and not all the details are known at this point in time and how to handle that. Thank you. And that's Dr. Christopher Ogilvy. We're now gonna go back to representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, a Viewer Sandy, who I think I know is a retired nurse, uh, writes, we always get total numbers of positive COVID and the accumulative numbers of deaths. What are the new admission numbers, the numbers in the ICU, which I think you mentioned, and the number recovered? Yeah, it's an important question, Sandy, and, and I do mention that every day. Uh, the additional, as I said today, the additional folks that are in the hospital as from the day before are 25. Uh, so now we're at 3,127. I try to mention that every day. And I probably didn't mention today, but the ICU uh, number in the ICU actually went up slightly as well. There were eight more people that went to the ICU at 8, 818 now at this point. And the hospitalization rate still stands at, um, at uh, 4%. Uh, but again, if, if you look back at these numbers um, going back, oh, I think it was back on uh, April 21st, I think it was, where we were at uh, 3,009, over 3,900, almost 4,000 people were in the hospital. So you can see from uh, 3,900 know, down to 3,127, we're actually going in the, in the right direction. Thank you, Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. We're gonna go back to Dr. Christopher Ogilvy. Dr. Ogilvy, uh, you just mentioned that you performed surgery as recently as yesterday. Um, and you're also a founder of the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, which is a support group, uh, among other things, for both survivors and also for families uh, who have members who have survived or not survived. Uh, now during COVID-19, what kind of support is available to the people that you treat or the people that are affected by the brain aneurysm so this is a great question. It's something I meant to mention when I was first speaking, but very rapidly, we've tried to mobilize in Zoom format uh, or by computer format, uh, support and more information for patients with various diseases, but specifically for brain aneurysms, they now have online support groups. Um, they have online information uh, and they have video information and video chats. So this is all available and it's very nicely linked up through their website. It's uh, bafound.org. And uh, you can go there to get information about diagnosis, treatment, and also follow-up care and follow-up support. So a lot of support groups that we used to have on a weekly or monthly basis here in the hospital where people got together, 
found it of great value to discuss with other patients and families what they were going through, I was now done online and uh, through Zoom chat like we're doing right now, and it's been uh, very successful. We're also using this format uh, for office visits. Um, we really need to keep people connected to their physicians and to their healthcare, to their medical problems. Uh, when this all first happened, people were a bit stunned, both physicians and patients in terms of you know ha what to do. And there was a lot of disconnection going on. I think there still is, but I, we have to reiterate that, that um, these services are available and we're trying rapidly to make them more available. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to go back to Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, a viewer, Jan, writes, why has there been a significant decrease in testing the past two days, if you know? Yeah, well, one of the theories is that uh, Sunday the, the testing went down because it was Mother's Day, maybe. Um, but also the, then yesterday the testing was down a little bit as well. Um, not, not quite sure what that is. Uh, but is, but we are looking to ramp up to about 30 to 35 testing uh, per day. We have been running on average about 15,000 per, uh, per day. Uh, but I think you're going to start seeing that ramp, uh, that ramp up. Um, with, I, I do want to go back to quickly, Steve, to what Sandra had asked about as, as well. I think she also asked about the number of people recovered. It's hard for us to, to figure out how many people have recovered. Uh, and that, but that's what the contact tracing is all about as well. However, you, you, can, you can assume by the numbers, if there are, if there are 80,000 people that have been tested positive and there's been 5,100 people who are, have passed away and there's 3,100 in the hospital, then you can, you can probably safely assume that there's you know, a good majority of the people that have been tested positive um, have, actually, uh, ha have actually recovered from it. So, uh, but it's hard to actually, because it's such a moving target to try to get the exact numbers. Yes, uh, that was Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, next, we have a question on testing for employers. Uh, businesses that can open soon, can they request testing for all their employees? And uh, I'm first going to go to uh, Amy Naples from the Chamber of Commerce. Amy, uh, do you happen to know how to respond to that? Unfortunately, I don't. Um, I think that is such a great question. Um, but I, I don't have that answer. And I'll go I back can, to Representative yeah. Muratori. Uh, Matt, do you have an yeah, answer? No. We need to get back to that viewer. Yeah, no. The, I mean, the, the testing uh, as of this time is still the same. It's, it's testing based on need by contacting your PCP if you need it. Um, so it, it, there's not going to be uh, every single person is going to be tested. It's only if you fit the criteria um, of having to be tested will you be done. We're going to go back now to our panel. They've all had a chance to hear each other speak and we're going to ask them for their final uh, comments and what viewers should remember today. We're going to go with first with Dr. Mark Wilson, our uh, epidemiologist in Plymouth. Mark, what's the takeaway? I guess what I would offer is that we should all be thankful that we're living in a state where scientific evidence is being applied to reduce the risk of COVID and to protect our health. Uh, the data and the models are being balanced against the, the goal of reopening the economy. Um, and we're going to have to continue living with some restrictions for a while, maybe quite a while. Uh, but this is all to avoid a rebound. Um, so let's tolerate this as best we can. Uh, respect the, the fact that data and, and evidence are being used to protect us and continue to respect your fellow citizens by wearing a mask. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson, epidemiologist from Plymouth. We'll go to Michael Jackman from Congressman Keating's office. Mike, what would you like our viewers to remember today? And we need you to unmute. Go ahead. OK, there we are. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, as I do every week. I just want to mention the census again. The 2020 census is ongoing, obviously due to the current situation. Uh, folks are not able to, census workers are not able to go door to door and do the traditional uh, canvas that they do each, uh, each uh, decade, every 10 years. So please do uh, go online, my2020census.gov, or give a call to the census to find out how you can respond if you haven't done so already. The phone number is 844-330-2200. And in Spanish, it's 
1-800-468-2020. So please do respond. It's so important that everyone is counted um, by the census because it means so much to resources and funding that we get here in, in the Commonwealth um, and for the town of Plymouth. So uh, thank you again, and uh, I look forward to next week. Thank you, Michael Jackman, Congressman Keating's office. Heather Cosby, your final thoughts? Thank you. I um, I just want to say, I mean, getting back to business is so essential on so many levels. And I just want to, for the employers and the employees, just take a breath and uh, act out of, um, you know, compassion and common sense. It's going to be a bumpy road. People are going to be nervous to come to work. Employers are going to feel like they're going to be sued left and right if somebody gets yeah. sick. Yeah. So um, really, everybody just try and keep a level head and do the best, follow the guidelines. And, you know, people are, are going to get sick in this process. That is going to happen. So it's not going to be perfect. But everybody needs to just do their best to make smart decisions as you go through this. Uh, and lastly, I just I want to give a big shout out to all the panelists and that do this with all their time. It's all volunteer and specifically to, to Steve, Ken and Matt that you do this every day. I think this has been a remarkable thing for our community and to have such great uh, panelists come in and provide information has been wonderful. So thank you. And PAC TV and uh, and everything. And, and Amy, great job with Couchella. Fantastic. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. We all deserve a big pat on our back. Thank you, Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA, Amy Naples, Executive Director, Plymouth Theory Chamber, your thoughts. Absolutely. Always such great information from our panelists. Again, as Heather said, this show continues to great, be such a great resource for our community. Um, always a pleasure seeing our Wednesday crew. And as always, we encourage you to support our small local businesses. We're very impressed by the businesses that are adapting and providing opportunities for you to support them in a very safe manner. So go out and support your local businesses in a safe manner. Um, but for all my small businesses out there, keep up the great work and hang in there. And as always, if I can be of any assistance, um, call 508-830-1620 or certainly by email by visiting our website. Um, and certainly stay up to date with all of the Chamber's happenings um, on Facebook with the handle Plymouth Area Chamber. Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're going to go back to Dr. Christopher Ogilvie. He is with the Brain Aneurysm Institute in Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, Dr. Ogilvie, what should our viewers remember uh, from today's presentation? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you all for, for having me. I am so immersed in this, in the hospital setting, that I kind of lose the granularity in the community setting that you're bringing to this. And I really think this is crucial. Uh, a lot of the rules we're all working with are changing, as you all know, as you get your emails. When the hospital here, sometimes our email rules change every six to 12 hours on how to handle patients, what the right protocols are. And as those things change, the only way to keep up with it, and people get tired of watching the news. So sometimes social media, Facebook, things like the event we've just put on here today are really the way to keep it accurate and and. Uh, you know, I was on the phone this morning trying to deal with some changes in protocols that were different five days ago. <laughs> so I think this is crucial to do this, uh, at least for the next several weeks as we get to figure out what the rules really are going to be. Um, and I reiterate what I started with, which is don't let your medical care um, uh, go to the wayside just because you think you're in lockdown. If you're having symptoms of anything, stroke, heart attack, uh, you know, any kind of symptoms, there are avenues to get information about this, often um, uh, not in person these days. So we, we continue to do that. And thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Christopher Ogilvie. He is a neurosurgeon. He does brain surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess in Plymouth, a professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Ogilvie and all of our participants, Dr. Wilson, Michael Jackman, Heather Cosby, Amy Naples, and we come back uh, to our Plymouth State Representative, Matthew Muratori. And as Dr. Ogilvie said, this is our goal with this presentation, is to provide information uh, to our community as we respond to the coronavirus. It has evolved. The protocols continue to change. And you've been delivering that, Matt, from the state level. Yeah, and the, and the protocols will, will definitely change even more so. Uh, as we move into our next phase of starting Monday. Uh, but uh, Dr. Ogilvie is, is right on. Um, please don't delay any treatments that you need. Uh, please hear, uh, listen to his advice. 
uh, see your PCP, call your PCP, go to the hospital if you need to. Um, you know, Dr. Wilson talked about the, the trends and, and, and Sandy asked some, a great question about these, these numbers. It's important that, that we're getting these numbers uh, out to you uh, so you're understanding uh, the facts as they are, the data as they are, because we will be driven by the data, uh, not by dates, but by data. And so it's important to, to keep on top of this, this information, to understand the information. And we try to provide in a day that we try to provide it in a way that actually um, makes some sense to all of you. So you understand where we've been and where we are now and where we're going. Um, and, and the panels, I, I really love the ones. I love all the panels every day, but I really particularly appreciate Wednesdays uh, with, with Mike Jackman and Amy and, and Heather, because it takes a lot off my plate dealing with federal and, and PPP information and, and, and local business information. And, uh, but I really appreciate uh, all your all your support on the Wednesday show. And uh, Amy, another terrific job with uh, the Chamber and the Concello. Uh, it's a terrific, terrific event and uh, unbelievable the amount of money you've raised for the local communities. And we're going to need to be doing more of these type of things, more working together as community. Um, to get through this together. Um, Monday's not going to be the opening of it, um, you know, and it, this is going to be a long, we're going to be in this for the long haul. So the more we can do together as a, as a community in Plymouth, I, I think the better we will be in the long run. And with that said, I think it's, uh, it's very clear that we still need to stay the course. We need to stay informed, uh, stay informed by, if you ha uh, by going to the mass.gov forward slash COVID-19 website. If you have questions, call 211. If you want to get text alerts, which is the best way to find out information, you can text COVIDMA to 888-777, or in Spanish, COVIDMA ESP to 888-777. Or you can go, if you have health questions, go to bowie.com forward slash mass. Uh, again, stay calm, uh, stay home. Again, you're saving lives if you're staying home. Uh, so we really appreciate that. And uh, again, we want to thank all the uh, essential uh, employee uh, employees who are taking care of our physical health and those essential employees who are taking care of our economic health. And remember, the more we come together by staying apart, the faster we will get to we will get back to the people we love and the things we love to do. So thanks again to uh, Julie and, and, and the folks at PAC TV and you, Steve. Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, this is our 44th update. Matt and Ken, you've been at all of them. What do you want to say to our viewers today? Well, I'm actually going to repeat some of the things that have already been said because I think they're important. And that is the first and foremost, thank you to the panelists today. There hasn't been a, a time on the 44 programs that we've done together that I haven't come away learning something new or feeling reinforced by the information that's been given to us by my experts. And uh, there's been so many people that have volunteered their time day after day, and we still have a, a long journey ahead of us, but thank you so much. Uh, also, um, I, I just want to make a point. Uh, we're all, I think, pleased to hear that the governor has a four-point program that he's going to begin working on, but we know that that's going to come with restrictions, and the protocols are going to change just as we look at them locally for our beaches, our walking areas, our ponds, there are going to be rules that are being put in place. And I know that so many people do not like that. But at the end of the day, just sit down and reflect on what, what we're doing. We're trying to save people from becoming ill. That's our goal. It takes work. It takes in, it's inconvenient. And we need to uh, take a page from the greatest generation's uh, life on this earth where they made the sacrifices. There are more ahead of us, but... By doing these together, we will defeat this virus. Thank you. Thank you. That's Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Again, thank you to all our guests. We'll be here each day. Tomorrow, Matt, Ken, and I will be joined by uh, my brother, Dr. Philip Trefletti. He's an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. Also, Stephen Cole. He is the executive director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. I'm Steve Trefletti, Plymouth Town moderator. Thank you, and good day. Good day, everybody. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Good. Um.